Welcome to San Andreas. I'm Dougie from Michigan. Dislike this video and I'll sleep with your bitch again. Here in Detroit, I don't get no sleep, beefing with anybody competing, even TGB. I've told you how much I love Thrillville. I've told you why GTA 3 makes me want to kill. I've talked about sequeling Freedom Fighters. And I still think VCS needed better writers. And you've seen me play games like Left 4 Dead, Among Us, Sims, Fable 3, even golf with your friends. Or we can take it even further to Gang Beasts, Roblox, Fortnite, GTA 5 RP. But even though modern games like to betray us, I've never gone wrong with GTA San Andreas. It's just what I always come back to. I'm always down to play it over anything new. And truth be told, this is where it all started. Back when I was little and just a bit retarded. I used to play this game for hours on end. It even used to feel like all my homies were my friends. And it used to feel like Sweet and Smoke were my friends. And it used to feel like Caesar and Woozy were my friends. Hell, even Loke was my friend. Every single person in this game was my friend. Well, maybe everyone but Shermhead. And to be honest, that bus is better off dead. Anyway, without essay, there ain't no Doug, cause this is the game that made me fall in love. So for those reasons, and many more that I can't rhyme, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas is the greatest video game of all time. On October 26, 2004, our world was graced with a video game that many, including myself, consider to be the greatest of all time. Sure, there are plenty of games that have come out in the 20 years since that have made efforts to take that title from this masterpiece, including some made by the same company. But for one reason or another, whether it be its roller coaster of a story, its immaculate amount of features, or simply the influx of nostalgia I feel whenever I boot it up, GTA San Andreas has remained the GOAT of gaming for me. And can you really blame me? This is where it all really started. Some of my earliest gaming memories, and even some of my earliest memories in general, center around this game, which isn't too shocking since I've probably been playing it since about the age of 4. Which, I just want to say real quick that I love my parents for letting me play this game at such a young age, because without San Andreas, such a major part of my childhood, and even my life, would have been incomplete. But it's not just nostalgia that fuels my love for this perfect game. As I said, San Andreas has an incomprehensible list of features for a PlayStation 2 game that so many modern titles have struggled to replicate. From the inclusion of RPG stat building elements, to managing relationships with multiple girlfriends across the map, to a list of cheat codes longer than the list of Jericho, as well as so many more features that we'll dive into later on, San Andreas does such an incredible job at not just creating an open world to explore and play missions in, but filling that world with all these things to do that will keep a player like myself coming back almost two decades after its original release, to still discover new things in this sandbox of endless possibilities. And in addition to all of that, San Andreas is tied together with an emotional emotional story chock full of betrayal, survival, brotherhood, family, and redemption across its 100 missions that reward longtime GTA players with fan service and callbacks to previous titles, while also giving new players dedicated enough to play through the story all of these characters to emotionally invest themselves in. So with all of this and so much more in mind, it's undeniable that GTA San Andreas is an amazing video game, but to me, it's nothing short of being the greatest video game of all time. And over the next however many minutes this video video ends up being, I'm going to tell you why. First and foremost, you know we gotta talk about the story. As I said before, this game takes us on an emotional roller coaster through its lengthy 100 missions, the most out of any GTA game. But while such a girthy story mode might be a turnoff for some, I can assure you that Bigger, and Blacker for that matter, is significantly better as the introductory arc gives you enough time to become emotionally attached in one way or another to these characters who will become very important as the story continues on, and the seemingly slow progression through the rest of the story allows you to ground yourself in whatever situation the cast find themselves in at each particular moment of it. But speaking of the story, let's finally start to tell it. At the very beginning of the game, we're treated to a few cutscenes that set the tone for this game's first arc. Right off the bat, we're introduced to Carl Johnson, or CJ, who's been living in Liberty City for the past five years since his brother Brian died. But in the wake of his mother's death, he's returned to Los Santos to be with the rest of his family, Sweet and Kendall. As soon as he arrives, however, he's confronted by some familiar corrupt crash officers, Tenpenny and Pulaski, as well as a rookie called Hernandez. Right away, Tenpenny blackmails CJ into doing his future dirty work by threatening to frame him for the death of Officer Pendleberry, a cop they killed for trying to expose their corruption. Following his meeting with Crash, CJ returns to his childhood house where he reunites with an old friend, Big Smoke. The two then drive out to CJ's mom's funeral, where we're introduced to Sweet, Kendall, and Ryder. Following a warm welcome back to Los Santos, the funeral gets shot up by some ballas, our rival gang, and CJ and company are forced to escape them on bicycles as they ride back to the safety of Grove Street. Over the course of 
the next several missions, we learn that the families, CJ's old gang, have fractured in his absence and are now shells of their former selves. So in missions like tagging of turf, cleaning the hood, and nines and AKs, we work with Sweet, Ryder, and Smoke to re-strengthen our gang and begin building it back up to its former glory. Through these missions, as well as others like drive through and Drive-By that feature all three of CJ's friends, we're given some perspective into these guys' dynamic and history as a friend group, truly making us feel like one of the gang as we laugh along with their antics. Before long, we're introduced to a couple of other important characters in the story. The first of which is Jeffrey, another old friend who's just gotten out of prison, except he's much different from how CJ knew him before. Nowadays, Jeffrey goes by the name OG Loke and is an aspiring rapper. The only problem is that he's basically the 90s equivalent of an aspiring SoundCloud rapper from nowadays, and by that I mean he fucking sucks. So he needs our help stealing from the hottest rapper in Los Santos, Mad Dog, in a side plot that'll have more significance near the end of the story. The next character is CJ's sister, Kendall's boyfriend, Cesar Villapando, who Sweet immediately stereotypes as a cholo gangbanger who Kendall's just slutting out for. To the contrary, when we meet him, Caesar lays out to CJ that whether the Johnson brothers want to accept it or not, he truly loves Kendall and he's not going anywhere. And with that, by standing up to CJ, he earns his respect and ultimately goes on to become a much better brother than Sweet could ever dream of being, as we'll see throughout the rest of the story. One more character we meet as well is Denise, a girl that we almost kill while burning down Ivago's hideout for Tenpenny, but then rescued to become CJ's first girlfriend of the game. And at least in my head canon, his canonical girlfriend. As the story continues, the families start returning to their former glory as we start taking over territories throughout Los Santos and even attempt to reunite several of the gang's sets. However, everything we've tried to build back up soon comes crumbling right back down in the final mission of this arc, the Green Saber. For some context, the iconic Green Saber is the car that was used in the drive-by in which CJ's mother was murdered, and up until this point, it's been assumed that it was just some random attack by the Ballas. But when Caesar calls CJ and tells him to meet him under the overpass, we see Ryder, Big Smoke, and Tenpenny bringing the infamous vehicle out of a garage, revealing that the three have colluded to have CJ's mom killed. This right here is the emotional climax of the story, because up until this point, our quartet with Smoke, Ryder, and Sweet felt like an unstoppable force of childhood best friends, who each wanted to see the Grove reach unimaginable heights and conquer the world together. But watching this bomb drop is one of the biggest gut punches I've ever experienced. And what's worse is that you don't even have time to process the betrayal. Because as all this is going down, Sweet's on the other end of town walking into what we now realize is a trap, which means we have to quickly drive across Los Santos to come to his rescue and take our emotions out on these goddamn ballas. After surviving their forces, the police eventually arrive to put an end to the violence, arresting both Sweet and CJ following the chaos. However, this story can't end with CJ just going to jail. No, 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 no. Rather, we're taken by Tenpenny and dropped off in the middle of nowhere. Far away from home, the next arc starts us off at rock bottom and forces us to find a way to get back on our feet. This involves working with Caesar's cousin, who just so happens to be the main antagonist of GTA 3, Catalina, in a series of robberies that do a decent job at showcasing the various small towns of Red County. The primary focus of these robberies is to pay off Tenpenny's debts to his weed dealer, The Truth, who we'll talk more about in a moment. But for now, let's just talk about Caesar and Kendall for a minute. In the mission appropriately named King in Exile, we see the two have joined CJ out in Angel Pine, but an aggressive Caesar is ready to go right back to Los Santos and retake what's rightfully his. Now there's one line in particular that he drops during this cutscene that always gives me chills. We already know who the fucking bad guys are, man. That calmed anger in his voice and desire for vengeance in his body language tells the whole story. But knowing they're all too weak to do anything right now, CJ and Kendall voice some reasoning into him, assuring him that when the time is right, business will be taken care of. During our time out in the countryside, we start becoming acquainted with some of the locals. The first of which is Catalina, who I've already mentioned CJ starts robbing with. But throughout each mission, we see the two form a brief relationship that quickly ends by the final robbery. After Caesar gets in contact with the local street racing scene, we also meet Wootsie Moo, or Woozy, the leader of the triads in San Fierro, and beat him in a respectful race through the countryside. In the following mission, CJ participates in another race where we interact with Catalina again, learning that she's found a new boyfriend, Claude, the protagonist of GTA 3, effectively prologuing the story to game San Andreas' predecessor. After we go on to beat him in a race, CJ wins a garage in San Fierro from them, while the happy couple move on to live a happy life in Liberty City where I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to them. Finally, in the last mission of this brief arc, CJ finishes paying for Tenpenny's drugs and drives out with him to begin his new life in San Fierro. Then when we arrive at the garage with Caesar and Kendall, CJ realizes it's an absolute shithole and starts flipping out, but Kendall quickly gets fed up with his attitude and tells him to take these lemons and make some goddamn lemonade. Some sound advice that he soon follows with the Truth's help. After going through a mission that doubles as a tour of San Fierro, CJ and Truth recruit a few side characters, Jethro and Dwayne from Vice City, as well as Zero, to help run the place. Throughout the course of this next arc, we start taking 
taking some steps towards our vengeance. Starting off in the mission photo opportunity, we discover that Ryder is working with a group called the Loco Syndicate, made up of a pimp Jizzy B, the leader of the San Fierro Rifas T-Bone Mendez, and a mysterious man called Mike Torino to supply cocaine to the Balas to distribute throughout Los Santos. Over the next several missions, we infiltrate the Syndicate to take them down from the inside, ultimately taking out all four men I just mentioned. Yep, definitely all four of them. In addition to the Loco Syndicate mission chain, there's also some other side plots that take place during this arc. Let's first briefly talk about Zero, who's engaged in a surprisingly violent war with a fellow nerd known simply as Berkeley. In these missions, the two are pretty much trying to kill each other, but with CJ's help, Zero is able to fend Berkeley off and send him packing from San Fierro. I would go more in depth on this mission chain, but trust me, I'll be coming back to these infamous missions later on. There's also a couple of crash missions sprinkled in here, just to remind CJ that even while he's upstate, he's still under Tenpenny's thumb. Meanwhile, as we arrive in San Fierro, CJ is brought back into contact with Woozy and proceeds to do various jobs for him to strengthen the Mountain Cloud Boy's influence in the city, for which Carl is unknowingly rewarded later on. Lastly, we have some missions involving a car dealership across the street from the garage. After purchasing it, CJ and Caesar begin sourcing cars throughout the city and selling them at the dealership. But what I love about these missions in particular is just the conversations that occur during the cutscenes and dialogues. Namely, Caesar talks to Carl about being in San Fierro, and though he says that the Vario back in Los Santos will always be his home, it's alluded that maybe he wants to settle down here with Kendall. Supplemented by the two's talks about how involved Kendall has gotten in the business, it really does feel like after the events of San Andreas, Caesar and Kendall might have left Los Santos' gang life behind them to live a more legitimate life in San Fierro. I also just really like the conversation between Kendall and CJ in the next mission, where she talks about how they're almost living a normal life. And after CJ brings up eventually getting sweet out of prison, Kendall asks him to be careful and says she doesn't want to lose Carl again. This calm and warming cutscene may be a far cry from the action we're used to seeing in this game, but as little moments like this with the love between these family members is on display that makes this story feel so real. Once that calmness and realness has passed, however, it comes time for the story to start flying off the handles a little bit. Remember that mysterious Mike Torino guy I mentioned earlier? Well, after you finish up in San Fierro, CJ gets contacted by an anonymous caller and is instructed to travel to Bone County. And that anonymous man is quickly revealed to be Mike Torino, who could have fucking thought? Oh, and he's also been working as an undercover government agent the entire time he was working with T-Bone and Jizzy. But now that that whole operation has come to an end, Torino forces CJ to help him with his government duties. And in exchange, Torino will ensure sweet safety in prison and eventual release. Now, like I said, this is where the story starts flying off the chain. Starting off, CJ and Caesar have to intercept and hijack a moving semi on the highway in a very action movie-like sequence. Then, a few missions later, we have to embark on a plane mid-takeoff, kill some government agents inside it, plant a bomb, and parachute out the back while looking away from the subsequent explosion like a badass. And if that wasn't enough for you, CJ is then asked by the truth to infiltrate the GTA equivalent of Area 51 and steal a motherfucking jetpack. And somehow, CJ survives all of this through the power of being a GTA protagonist. Now, I know I'm talking a lot of shit here due to lack of realism, but these wacky and outlandish missions are really fun to play through, and they further establish CJ as this unstoppable machine en route to taking his revenge at the end of the game. Once that's all taken care of, we finally arrive in Las Venturas to finish taking over the rest of the state before we can take back our home. While CJ's still working for Torino, he's once again contacted by Woozy, who tells him about a new casino that he and the triads are opening up. When CJ arrives, Woozy tells him about the struggles that the casino is facing with the mafia-run casino down the street, and he asks him for help in exchange for partial ownership of the new business. This leads to a pair of mission chains that center around a turf war between the Four Dragons and Caligula's casinos, in which CJ helps Woozy compromise the Mafia's sabotage attempts, as well as infiltrates the Caligula's to plot a heist against them. During these missions, we're once again contacted by the truth, to pick up a couple of travelers he'd been doing peyote with in the desert, with one of them turning out to be the manager of the band Love Fist, Kent Paul from Vice City, and the other being a guy named Macker, a member of a new band he'd been managing. After picking them up, we drive them back to Los Venturas, where CJ meets Ken Rosenberg, who's taken up the stressful role of running the casino for the Leone, Sindaco, and Ferrelli crime family since leaving Vice City. Along the way, we run into Mad Dog, that rapper at whose expense we helped OG Loke back in Los Santos. Following CJ's actions of killing his manager and stealing his rhyme book back at the beginning of the game, we find Mad Dog in Las Venturas, possibly drunk but definitely high, up on this balcony and threatening to jump as a crowd cheers him on from the ground. CJ pleads with him not to jump, but eventually has to steal a truck and catch him before dropping him off at a rehab clinic. Meanwhile, we also have a couple more run-ins with Tenpenny and Pulaski, who are clearly on edge as they know about some evidence against them being gathered. During our first mission with them, Hernandez is notably absent, but nonetheless, we're sent to kill the FBI agent carrying the evidence and collect it from him. After the job is done, Tenpenny calls CJ to hand over the dossier out in the middle of nowhere, and it's here that Tenpenny kills Hernandez for ratting on them. He then leaves Pulaski to kill CJ, but with Tenpenny long gone, CJ turns the tables and takes Pulaski out instead. 
Once these side plots are dealt with, it's time to turn our focus back towards the casino. As tensions heat up in the Caligulas, Salvatore Leone arrives to take over its operations and plans to have Rosenberg, Kent Paul, and Mac are killed. After doing a few missions for him to earn his trust, CJ manages to help the three escape and proceeds to rob the casino with Woozy and the Triads. We're then met again by Mad Dog, where it's revealed that after his career went downhill, his drug addiction led him to giving up his mansion to a Vago dealer, leading the CJ and the Triads airdropping in to take the place back and establish it as our base of operations for our return to Los Santos. And with that, it's time to begin the final arc of the story. With Mad Dog's crib under our control, CJ recruits Rosenberg and Kent Paul to work as Mad Dog's accountant and producer respectively, as the Johnson family starts to settle into their new life that they've built for themselves. But before we can get too comfortable, there's still the matter of getting Sweet out of prison, which leads to Mike Torino re-entering the picture to force CJ to do one last job. Don't worry, it's nothing too big or anything. Just stealing a military VTOL jet off a naval base, killing some Air Force pilots in an ensuing dogfight, and destroying some spy ships in the middle of the sea. Nothing too crazy. Once that's done though, Torino finally lives up to his word and frees Sweet from prison. When CJ goes to pick him up, he's excited to show him everything that he and Kendall have done while Sweet's been locked up, but all Sweet's interested in is checking on the hood. In what's probably gotta be the most polarizing moment in the entire game, CJ tries to tell his brother that everybody else has moved on to bigger and better things. But after Sweet reminds CJ of the responsibility to look after their homies, the Johnson brothers head back to Grove Street and start rebuilding the gang that Ryder and Big Smoke destroyed back at the beginning of the game. But while they're busy reestablishing the family's presence in Los Santos, we've still got a few loose ends to tie before the story can come to its end. First, Mad Dog has a bone to pick with OG Loke for stealing his career and nearly driving him to suicide. So once he finds out where he's filming a new music video at, Dog and CJ pay Loke a visit, leading to a chase through Los Santos that ends with Mad Dog signing with Loke's record label. Next, it's time for Officer Tenpenny to pay for his crimes. Despite his best efforts, a case was made against him for everything he's done, not just to CJ, but to the streets of Los Santos in general. And he's finally being held accountable for his actions as he heads to court. Miraculously, however, he's been acquitted of everything he'd been accused of, leading to a riot in the streets that takes place until the end of the game. Amidst the chaos, CJ and Sweet work to lock down Grove Street from the rioters. But at this point, Caesar comes to us for help to take back the Vario. With a couple of GSF members at our side, we work with Caesar and a few Aztecas to take back their home from the Vagos, finally helping them return to their former glory, much like the Grove has begun to do. I also have to mention real quick that during this mission, we get a brief conversation between Caesar and Carl in which Caesar tells him that he wants to ask Kendall to marry him. Before he can though, he asks CJ to talk to Sweet to make sure he's fine with this. And of course, Carl agrees to help him, which Caesar is very appreciative of. This is just another one of those character building moments that shows how far these two have come since they first met, as well as how close they've become. And it just makes me so thrilled to know that this man who's become CJ's brother in arms over the course of the game will now be his brother-in-law after it's all over. Now with everything else settled, it's finally time to confront Big Smoke. When the Johnsons travel through the still rioting streets of Los Santos, we arrive outside of Smoke's crack fortress where CJ tells Sweet that he has to do this alone. After all this shit, Sweet and Ryder talk to him at the beginning of the game for running to Liberty City following Brian's death, and after being told again by Sweet after being freed from prison that he's only ever cared about himself, CJ decides that the only way to prove that he ain't no busta is to finish this on his own, to which Sweet responds by respecting his wishes and agreeing to wait in the car. Now all alone, CJ busts into the building and infiltrates the fortress, sweeping floor after floor of Balas, Vagos, Rifas, and all of Smoke's other forces until he finally confronts Big Smoke himself. A boss battle against Smoke and his goons ensues, but once the fat boy's down, CJ shares an emotional moment with him as Smoke explains how he became corrupted by his greed and lust for power. Once Smoke is gone, Tenpenny arrives to have one last dialogue with Carl, holding him at gunpoint as he forces him to pack up a suitcase full of Smoke's money before trying to kill him. CJ barely dodges Tenpenny, however, thank you plot armor, and forces him to retreat. We then have to fight our way through Smoke's forces again as we work our way back down the now burning fortress. Once CJ makes it back outside, he sees Tenpenny escaping with a fire truck as Sweet jumps on the back of it. After following the truck for a while through the streets of Los Santos, we eventually catch Sweet in our car and let him take the wheel while CJ shoots off any attackers. The chase continues through the rioting streets as gangsters and cops try to stop the Johnson brothers. But by the end of it, Tenpenny crashes the fire truck through the Ganton Bridge and poetically lands in the middle of Grove Street, dying in the heart of the families he'd used and abused for years. Following a short cutscene of the main character standing over Tenpenny's corpse, we're treated to a more uplifting cutscene that starts off with CJ, Sweet, Kendall, and Caesar talking about keeping up with their business ventures and maintaining Grove Street supremacy. Before long, Rosenberg, Kent Paul, Macker, and Mad Dog arrive to announce Dog's first gold record. After discussing what the group's next course of actions will be, with Sweet, Kendall, and Mad Dog each giving their own answers characterizing their own interests, CJ decides to head out, giving control back to the player and allowing them to make their choice on what to do next. And with that, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas' story comes to a close. And seriously, what a story it was. Like I said, this entire thing was a roller coaster from start to finish. At the very start of the game, we could feel this negative atmosphere surrounding everybody, showcased by CJ's flashbacks when he first enters his now deceased mother's house, as well as when Sweet lashes out at CJ and Kendall at the funeral. But as the story progresses through Los Santos, we start to get this vibe of things being just
just like the good old days as CJ reunites and reminisces with his childhood friends. We can also get this feeling of accomplishment start to take over as we help the Grove rise from its ashes to become a powerhouse in the gang scene like it was before CJ's initial disappearance, only for everything we've built up to topple right back down when Ryder and Big Smoke betray Sweet and CJ. Then with Sweet in prison and CJ in exile, we essentially hit rock bottom as we enter a point that's even lower than where we were at the start of the game, and somehow have to find a way to climb back up, and slowly but surely, we do exactly that throughout the course of the rest of the story. Along the way, we make several friends and allies, including The Truth, Zero, Woozy, and Mike Torino, all of whom help us in one way or another towards reaching the top and helping us exact our revenge, which we finally manage to do after 100 long missions. And honestly, apart from Sweet's questionable priorities regarding the gang life and the ultimate momentum stopper of having to conquer territories right before the final mission of the game, which I'll talk a bit more about later, the only negative I can come up with regarding San Andreas' story is just the fact that it ends. Because no matter how many times I play through this game, I'm always left wanting more. More missions, more screen time for characters, and just more story. Because I absolutely love every aspect about this game and so badly wish that there was a continuation of it in some way or another. At the very least, I wish there was some way to interact with the characters after the story finishes like how you can in GTAs 4 and 5. Because as I'm about to explain, these characters are another one of the main reasons why I love this game as much as I do. The characters of San Andreas are so realistic that it genuinely feels like you're there with them while completing the missions throughout this game. And their conversations with CJ during cutscenes feel so real as well. Let's start off with arguably one of the coolest members of Grove Street, Ryder. In my opinion, Shermhead here is a polarizing character because I've always thought he was such an asshole to CJ whenever the whole game was hanging out together, but whenever he and Carl are alone, they appear to be a lot closer than Sweet or even Big Smoke. And that's one of the things that I love about Ryder's missions so much is that they always show him and CJ getting along like childhood friends. Whether they're reminiscing about why Ryder Ryder never finished school or sharing their disdain for Officer Tenpenny, which just makes it all the sadder to know how their friendship ultimately ends. But on a quick side note, it's worth mentioning the rumor that Ryder wasn't originally set to betray CJ. While it's never been confirmed by Rockstar, I for one like to believe that his collusion with Smoke and Tenpenny was a last minute decision to write him out of the story, and this can be supported by the fact that almost all of Ryder's missions had to do with helping the Grove in some way, whereas most of Smoke's missions seem to revolve around his own personal interests. But I'm not going to go too far into this myth since that's not what this video is about, so if you'd like to know more about it, then I'd suggest doing your own research. Speaking of the iconic Big Smoke, it's impossible to talk about this game without mentioning this Cluckenbell devouring meme machine. Throughout your time getting to know Smoke in the first arc of this game, it becomes clear that he's the emotional support of the friend group who could provide anything from comic relief to words of wisdom whenever necessary. When we first meet Smoke in the Johnson's house, we're treated to an emotional reunion between these best friends to uplift Carl's spirits when he's hit by a wave of mournful feelings upon entering his deceased mother's house. As the two are talking, Smoke recites a line from the book. Same things make us laugh make us cry. He says this to describe CJ's mother in the moment, but what I especially love about this line is that the very same thing can be said about Smoke himself, because as much as he's made us all laugh through his antics throughout the first part of this game, well I think you'll be hard pressed to find a man who didn't cry at his betrayal and eventual death. Big Smoke is such an iconic character for his meme status alone, as while it may be difficult to find someone who's played through the story of San Andreas, it's damn near impossible to find someone who hasn't heard of the Big Smoke food order. But as memeable as Smoke is, he's just as iconic as a character for anybody who's finished San Andreas. Whether it's through dealing with his comedic antics like eating everybody's food while everyone else is involved in a drive-by or taking you to meet his cousin, Mary Jane, or just getting to hang out with him by doing some shooting practice with him or helping him evade a group of pursuing Russians off the back of a bike. Anytime you're tasked with being in Smoke's company, you're guaranteed to have a fun and memorable time. Or at least unless you're helping him kill some Vagos on top of a train, in which case Smoke may understandably become your least favorite character. All we had to do was follow the damn train, CJ! But after all of this, experiencing his betrayal at the end of Los Santos and listening to his last words after you finish him off at the end of the game is still so heartbreaking to me to this day. Switching away from the main friend group for a moment, let's move on to my favorite pair of characters in the game, Kendall and Caesar. Now when I was growing up, Kendall always struck me as the bitchy sister who was always mad about something and was taking it out on CJ. And to be fair, growing up I mainly only knew her from her cutscenes in Los Santos and the beginning of San Fierro. But after seeing these cutscenes again with a more mature mind, I understand more why she seemed so mean at first, and it more or less has to do with Caesar. When you first hear about Caesar, Sweet describes him as a cholo gangbanger who just wants to fuck your sister. But when you actually get to meet him, you can quickly tell that Kendall is much more to him than just some whore. He gives a heartfelt speech to CJ, expressing the true love that he feels for Carl's sister, ultimately earning his blessing and respect, and he ends up proving to be one of the best things that ever could have happened to the Johnson family. If it weren't for Caesar, CJ never would have learned about Smoke and Rider's betrayal and likely would have been killed alongside Sweet in the ambush in which Sweet was heavily wounded. If it weren't for Caesar, Kendall would have been stuck in Los Santos and CJ probably would have lost everybody close to him. Without Caesar, CJ wouldn't have met Woozy, wouldn't have won the San Fierro Garage from Claude, wouldn't have ever gone to Los Venturas, wouldn't have saved Mad Dog, and probably
probably never would have been able to go back to Los Santos and rescue Sweet. It's just amazing to think of how differently the events of San Andreas would have played out if it weren't for Caesar Vialpando, or rather, just how short of a game it would have been instead. As for Kendall, I've grown to have a lot of respect for her. As I said before, I used to strongly dislike her for how she treated everybody else, especially CJ, but now that I understand her character more, I realize she wasn't disrespectful out of malice, but rather, she was standing up for herself, mostly against Sweet, and standing up for her boyfriend. Throughout the rest of the game, we continue to see her character be displayed in cutscenes, such as the one in King in Exile, where she tries to calm Caesar down and doesn't allow him to get himself killed by returning to Los Santos prematurely. Later on, she starts to take up a more prominent role as the brains behind the Johnson family's operations by managing the business side of CJ's garage and helping operate the Ford Dragons Casino with Woozy. I think the main thing that I love about Kendall is that despite living in the Grover whole life, as soon as she has the opportunity for her and her family to live a life greater than the hood life, she hits the ground running and never slows down. Meanwhile, with Caesar, he repeatedly proves himself to be a worthwhile ally and a much better brother than Sweet could ever hope to be. Whenever we see CJ and Caesar with each other, they're always having a good time together, like when they're stealing cars from the garage or working perfectly in unison to achieve their goal, like in the missions Pier 69 and Hijack. But in addition to his relationship with CJ, we also get the occasional glimpse into his relationship with Kendall where you can't help but feel happy for the man for having the time of his life with the love of his life, especially when we learn about his intention to marry her. Back to our villains now, it's time to talk about Tenpenny, voiced by the ever charismatic Samuel L. Jackson to give us one of the most memorable main antagonists of any Grand Theft Auto game. When we first meet Tenpenny, we can tell that this arrogant son of a bitch is going to be a real pain in the ass to deal with, but thanks to that badge he's wearing and the goons he's got with him, he's nobody we can take lightly. We then learn that we're not his only target, as he frequently meets Ryder and Big Smoke to presumably force them to do his dirty work, just like us, except the real reason he visits them becomes much more evident later on. As a high-ranking officer in the crash unit, Tenpenny uses his authority to pit those in the hood against one another, balancing each king's influence throughout Los Santos to prevent any from getting too powerful. Of course, he does this in a not-so-very lawful way, so every once in a while, word of his offenses gets out, forcing us to snuff out his snitches. It's worth mentioning as well that as time goes on, Officer Hernandez, the rookie of the group, becomes less and less involved whenever Tenpenny and Pulaski confront CJ. Being completely absent from our screens from between the times that the trio of cops drop Carl off in the wilderness, all the way until his death scene where he's knocked out by Tenpenny for talking to the feds about his and Pulaski's actions. At this point in the game, Tenpenny is incredibly paranoid and edgy, which is no surprise since he knows the jeopardy that his life is in thanks to Hernandez. But either way, it always feels real nice to see this scumbag who's usually calm and in control of the situation start to fly off the rails once he's backed into this corner. And after everything that he does to CJ and his family throughout the story, it's just so cathartic to see this evil bastard get what he deserves at the end of the game, in a moment that completely juxtaposes the sadness that's delivered with Big Smoke's death minutes earlier. Staying on topic with authority figures, Mike Torino, phenomenally voiced by James Woods, is an enigmatic character who's introduced a lot later in the game than anybody else we're going to talk about, but he's arguably one of my favorites in this game for a variety of reasons. When we first meet Torino, he's just this mysterious man helping the Rifas push coke into Los Santos, but after we thwart his operation, he reveals himself as a government agent who has the power to get Sweet released from prison if CJ does what he asks. Through these first couple of missions, Torino assigns Carl some relatively tame tasks to see what he's made of, and once he's proven himself, he's given some more daunting challenges, like ground hugging a plane across the state and infiltrating a jet to kill a bunch of government agents. But as CJ continues to do these missions for Torino, it becomes clear that he's earning his respect as Torino talks down to him less and becomes more real with him over time. One thing specifically that I love about Torino is his banter with Carl where he can quickly go from talking condescendingly about history, claiming things like Hitler's suicide and the nukes on Japan to be untrue, stuff that a character like him would absolutely know the real truth about given his apparent occupation, to suddenly taking up a more serious demeanor as he explains to CJ what must be done, to on a dime switching up again to instill a level of comfortable confidence within Carl ahead of performing his next job. And when it's all said and done, after CJ finishes one final Mission Impossible level task, Torino keeps his word and arranges Sweet's release from prison in one of the most heartwarming cutscenes in the whole game. So what was that little job you was talking about, Torino? I just want you to go pick up your brother. Get out of here. And that's the last we see of Torino. And speaking of our brother, let's finally talk about Sweet. Now I understand there's a lot of hate for Sweet circulating out there, and while I can very easily justify it as I can understand where people are coming from, I also want to play a little devil's advocate here. When we're first introduced to Sweet, we meet him as this angry asshole who's yelling at his sister over nothing at their mom's funeral, and whose first instinct to seeing his brother after five years is to yell at him for being gone for five years. I'll talk more about his treatment towards Kendall in a second, but in his defense for yelling at Carl, he undoubtedly has a lot of anger built up towards him for abandoning their 
family after their other brother's death. And as Sweet elaborates in the mission drive through it's evident that the recent death of their mother gets the better of them here. At the end of this mission, and at the beginning of tagging up turf, we can see Sweet's bitterness towards Carl come back out as he believes he's just going to run back to Liberty City. But as CJ starts putting in work to help out the Grove and shows that he plans to stick around, we see their love start to flow back into their brotherly relationship. Later on in the mission Siege Reveal Pondo, the opening cutscene shows Sweet and Kendall getting into it again about her new boyfriend, and while I don't agree with what Sweet's saying about Caesar and their relationship, I do understand where he's coming from to a degree. When Kendall calls Sweet racist for not approving of their relationship, he quickly elaborates that the reason he's so quick to judge Caesar is because he doesn't know him as a person and only knows him as a rival gangster, which is why he understandably stereotypes his bad news. To add better perspective, Sweet would have had the same opinion whether Caesar was an Azteca or a Bala. The fact is that from his point of view, Kendall is getting involved in somebody he perceives could be dangerous, and after seeing Brian and their mother die, he doesn't want to lose another member of his family. Now while he was clearly wrong to think this way in the end considering how valuable Caesar turns out to be, I still understand why he was so hesitant to allow Kendall to date him. But based on the two's interactions at the tail end of the game, I think it's safe to say that Sweet's opinion on him ultimately changes. And I'd also like to believe that when Caesar asks CJ to get Sweet's blessing for his marriage to Kendall, that Sweet obliges and accepts him as a member of the family. But now, let's talk about probably the biggest reason why Sweet gets as much hate as he does, and it's when he finally gets released from prison. After spending the entire game trying to work out a way to free Sweet, CJ's excited to share with him the wealth and lifestyle that the rest of the family have built up in the meantime, only for Sweet to stubbornly reject it all and demand to return to the Grove. CJ adamantly tries to tell him to forget about the hood life that the rest of the family have left behind, but Sweet goes on to give him a speech about how CJ's only ever cared for himself, and tries to remind him about the importance of Grove Street families in what may be one of the most polarizing moments in Grand Theft Auto. I say this because I've heard arguments from both sides of the fence about whether or not Sweet is in the wrong for what he says to CJ. On the one hand, I can see why some players might hate Sweet for his views on the hood being bigger than his or CJ's lives, as the gang life shouldn't be glorified to the point where somebody who managed to pull himself out of that kind of situation should be vilified for doing what's best for them. But on the other hand, CJ and Sweet were two of Grove Street family's most prominent figures, alongside Ryder and Big Smoke. And after Sweet went to prison and CJ went into exile, GSF had a hard fall and his members likely felt abandoned by their leaders. So if Sweet's point is that CJ neglected his duties to protect the Grove and its followers, then maybe that point's more valid than some would like to believe. Personally, I can see where both sides are coming from, and maybe that's another reason why I like this game so much and why I identify so much with CJ. Sweet does a great job of representing his own argument, as he's on the side of the spectrum that believes the hood life to be all important. Meanwhile, their sister Kendall has shown numerous times throughout the game that she was meant for more than Grove Street families, given how well she's been able to manage the garage in San Fierro and how she's helping run the casino up in Las Maturas. CJ, though, he sort of falls in the middle of the spectrum, being able to run multiple businesses throughout San Andreas with the help of his sister, while also being willing to return the Grove to its former glory with the help of his brother. And I think that him falling in the middle of that spectrum is a great representation of the player, who should be able to do it all. Either way, even though the more realistic perspective that Sweet is 100% in the wrong for wanting to drag CJ back to the hood, rather than choosing to escape that level of poverty, is very rational. I personally feel like Sweet's unwillingness to abandon the followers that looked up to him and his friends, and his determination to rebuild his fallen empire is fairly admirable. And in the end, I think it leads to a much more heroic feeling ending for all of our characters. Speaking of characters, there are so many from this game that I could list and talk about in great detail. The Truth, Catalina, Woozy, Pulaski, Hernandez, OG Loke, and so many others. But we would literally be here for hours otherwise, so I think they'll just have to settle for those honorable mentions. But the main reason I wanted to talk about these characters is because they truly helped make this world feel so much more alive while playing through the story. They all felt so real to me that growing up, I would literally name some of my little army guy toys after them and create new scenarios for them with my imagination. And I feel like I'm probably not the only person to do something like this when I was little because there are so many YouTube channels like Kenny Poss and Los Santos Cast that have gone on to create scenarios and stories of their own and act them out in-game to create some hilarious videos. And none of this would have been possible if Rockstar hadn't created such iconic and intriguing characters nearly 20 years ago, nor would I likely be such a massive fan of this video game. But as memorable as so many of these characters are, there's a few missions that make this game even more memorable, for better or for worse. No! Every Grand Theft Auto has its iconic missions that, whenever revisited, are always sure to give its players either heavy nostalgia or severe PTSD. Vice City's got its memorable bank heist, Liberty City Stories has its Portland Chainsaw Masquerade, GTA 3's got its presser to go, and San Andreas has a wide variety of missions that fit this bill. Starting off with one that I absolutely love for a variety of reasons, let's talk about Big Smoke's Just Business mission. In this one, Smoke's got himself involved with the Russian Mafia, and we're not even going to question how. But after this deal goes wrong, CJ must help him fend them off 
and escape them. Now the initial shootout is nothing but textbook, but the escape sequence is where this mission really shines as it places CJ on the gun seat while smoke drives us to safety. If you've seen my video talking about Vice City stories, you're probably not going to be shocked to see me talking about this mission here since I spoke positively about Jive Drive for the same reason of allowing us to focus on shooting our pursuers while the AI drives us. But one other reason why I like this mission specifically is because of this badass Terminator inspired cutscene of the semi driving through the bridge. Also, fun fact, growing up, me and my brother used to call this mission the Terminator mission because of this cutscene. Also, quick honorable mention to reuniting the families for also giving you control of the gun while Big Smoke drives through the streets of Los Santos and makes some comically questionable decisions along the way. Next, let's briefly go over House Party. In this mission, the homies are having a party at OG Loke's house when they're suddenly ambushed by the Ballas. Now this mission isn't anything too special on the surface, mainly serving as a basic shootout against a few waves of enemies. But what I particularly like about this mission is that it puts you on the front lines of Grove Street and forces you to defend the family's hood as Ballas swarm you from every conceivable angle. I'll also give Doberman, Homecoming, Beat Down on Beat Up, and Grove for Life a group mentioned for their common use of the gang territory system. To briefly describe this mechanic, starting in the mission Doberman, Los Santos becomes covered in various gang territories, belonging to either the families, the Balas, or the Vagos, and you have the ability to capture rival territories. To capture one, you have to provoke a gang war by killing three rival gangsters within the territory, after which three waves of gangsters will spawn for you to take out. Once you eliminate the third wave, the territory becomes yours and your homies will start to spawn there. In Doberman, we're introduced to this mechanic as we have to take over Glen Park, but no matter how much territory you take over after this point, it'll all be reset when CJ gets exiled from Los Santos. That brings us back to home coming, way later in the story, where CJ and Sweet provoke a gang war on Grove Street to take it back from the Ballas. Afterwards, in the mission Beat Down on Beat Up, we reclaim Glen Park the same way as before, and in Grove for Life, we simply spread the family's territory out into Idlewood. All in all, I think the gang territory system is a pretty fun feature, but one more thing worth mentioning is that if you don't bother taking any more territories beyond these missions, then you'll eventually receive the ultimate cock block, as the final mission of the game will be locked until you conquer enough territories. Personally, I typically don't have to deal with this issue myself, since I'm one of the rare players who love the game territory system, so I'll usually just have enough territory anyway by the time I reach that last mission. But whenever I am trying to speed through the game and run into this wall, it does become a pretty tedious chore to have to go through to unlock the finale. However, one instance in which I've always run headfirst into that wall of anti-climax is whenever I reach the mission Amphibious Assault. If you've played through San Andreas a few times, I'm sure those words just sent a chill up your spine, because the prerequisite for this mission is to have like 50% lung capacity, and if you're just an average player, then chances are that you've only gone underwater a handful of times, if at all up to this point in the game because there's never really any reason to, apart from collecting oysters or exploring. So this means that in order to unlock this mission, you have to either tediously spend about 15 to 20 minutes swimming underwater and resurfacing as you wait for CJ to catch his breath to grind out the lung capacity stats, or you can do what I did in my recent playthrough. Activate the infinite lung capacity cheat code, max out the fast motion cheat code, and increase the speed of your emulator. Look, I've already done this the legit way plenty of times in my life, so if I can cut down this process to like 2 minutes just this one time for the sake of getting this video out faster, then I'm doing it. Still though, the fact that I have to go through this workaround in the first place is definitely a sign that something here wasn't thought through very well, and the fact that we haven't had a prerequisite like this in a GTA game since is pretty telling that Rockstar learned their lesson here. One more cool mission I want to bring up real quick is St. Mark's Bistro. Again, this mission isn't too special on the surface level, as it mainly sees you shooting through some enemies as you fight to the other end of the level, but what I specifically love about this mission is just the novelty that it primarily takes place in Liberty City. Apart from GTA 5's two missions that take place in North Yankton and GTA Online's Cayo Perico DLC, I believe this is the only time in GTA history that we actually get to travel to a different map, even if it's just a tiny portion of it. But hey, that tiny portion of a different map has inspired countless kids like me and my brother to go searching for Liberty City like it was Candy Island through that Ganton Gym jetpack glitch. So just for that reason alone, I would consider St. Mark's Bistro a pretty influential mission. But moving on from missions that fill me with joy to missions that make me want to punt a child, let's take a second to talk about the infamous mission, Wrong Side of the Tracks. Right, so before anybody comes at me saying, this mission is not even that hard, I just want to say that I agree with you. Playing this mission as an adult and understanding how Big Smoke's AI works here, this mission is honestly nowhere near as tough as it was when I played it as a kid. But that being said, Fuck Big Smoke. I know how sad I was at seeing his betrayal for the first time all those years ago, and I know how much I want to cry every time I see his death, but for all the times that I've heard this fat bastard yell all we had to do was follow the damn train, CJ. throughout my childhood, I just hope he's got enough number 9 larges down there in hell. Never mind what he did to CJ's mom. This mission is what he deserves to burn for. OG Loke is another mission that I always had a tough time with as a kid. In this mission, you and the just freed from prison OG Loke are set to kill this Vago named Freddy after Loke dropped the soap within his vicinity. Only problem is, Freddy is a goddamn god at riding crotch rockets, as well as riding crotches. 
I've heard. So chasing him down without knowing a scripted path is such a pain in the ass. Especially when your own bike skill is likely to be very low at this point, meaning anytime you run into anything, you and Loke are falling off that thing. Nowadays, it's not too difficult if you know Freddy's route, especially if you know how to intercept him and kill him early, but nevertheless, this was another mission that was frustratingly difficult for me once upon a time. And speaking of frustration, can I interest anybody in a quick photo opportunity? When you first start this mission in San Fierro, CJ receives a phone call from Caesar asking him to meet him somewhere out in the wilderness, which leads to quite the long drive, but nothing too annoying yet. Then, when you make it to Caesar, you have to drive him further out to a small town in the middle of nowhere, leading to an even longer drive. And then, when you inevitably fuck up, flip the car, and kill Caesar, you have to take an even longer drive back up to San Fierro just to start the whole thing again. This mission itself isn't inherently hard or anything, as it just pertains to you taking a few pictures of Ryder with the Loco Syndicate, but it's certainly infamous for its ridiculous amount of driving that shouldn't have ever even been a requirement, as it adds so much unnecessary annoyance. Especially when you do destroy the car and fail the mission once or twice. Oh yeah, and the cherry on top of all of that is that after you finish taking the pictures, Caesar just fucking ditches you and drives back to San Fierro on his own, leaving you to find your own way back. Oh well, I guess it's better than having you drive him back just to flip the car and fail after even more driving. But sticking with San Fierro, we have to go over what is arguably the most difficult mission in all of San Andreas. Supply Lines. Seriously, fuck this mission. Everything about it is bullshit. From the overly sensitive controls of the RC plane, to the damn thing being a glass cannon, and to this unnecessary ass time limit that doesn't actually tell you how much time you have left, because that would just be a little too easy, wouldn't it? But they add this thing just to add an artificial level of difficulty on top of everything else. Put that all together, and you have what is undeniably one of the hardest missions in all of Grand Theft Auto. In this mission, this fucking nerd called Zero needs your help killing his rivals, probably innocent delivery drivers. But rather than use something sensible, like a car to roll up on them, Zero wants you to use his special little RC plane for some goddamn reason. But the problem is that by playing this mission the intended way of dive bombing your targets, you're going to fail. There's no way around that, you're just gonna fail. Why? Because it's physically impossible not to. If you try to take out the enemies while staying in the air, or, you know, in other words, using the plane like it's a plane, you're probably not going to hit all your shots and will alert the driver, who will then frantically try to escape you as his passenger, should he have one, fires back at you and quickly destroys your toy plane with his real bullets. <laughs> Then, even if you do manage to kill the fuckers, well, you've still gotta get home, and with that fuel gauge rapidly declining, chances are you're gonna hit E well before you can return the plane back to Zero's shop. Because of all these frustrating mechanics, the ideal way to play what had the potential to be such a fun mission is to simply taxi the plane around when you approach your targets and quickly kill them before they can escape you or retaliate, making the experience tedious and boring. The only saving grace about this mission is the fact that it's optional and unnecessary to complete the story, but still, it gives me and many other San Andreas players nightmares to this very day. NOE, or Nap of the Earth, is another annoying mission that has the player fly a plane as close to the ground as possible in order to avoid detection by the Air Force, and you have to fly from one end of the map to the other and then back again. Now, this mission really isn't too bad if you're an alright pilot, but depending on your choice of hardware, your opinion on this mission may vary. See, if you're playing on a somewhat decent PC, then you shouldn't have too many issues with this mission since everything loads in properly, and you can see any obstacle that may be in your path well before you approach it. But as those of you who've played this on the PS2 all know, this mission is nothing short of painful. So during the first and last bits of this mission, it's nothing too crazy as you're just flying through the relatively barren desert and maybe over some water. But once you reach the wilderness, oh, once you reach the wilderness, that's when all hell breaks loose. Because you genuinely never know if your path is safe or not until you suddenly see that wasted screen accompanied by a tree loading in after the fact. Some game objects taking longer to load in than others is an issue in this game that usually doesn't get in your way too badly. But when you're flying a plane that will blow up the second that it runs into any stiff object, it becomes a very frustrating problem to overcome. Especially when you proceed to respawn on the other end of the map from the start of the mission. In short, San Andreas has a plethora of missions that add to the memorability of the game, for better and for worse. But while there's some missions that have garnered a bad reputation for how ridiculously difficult they may have been, or how unfair the game itself might have made them, what game doesn't have these kinds of missions? There's always gonna be those one or two missions in any video game that, when you come back to it, you dread having to play through them. But you still do, because the rest of the game makes them worth powering through. And with 100 total missions in San Andreas, there are bound to be a handful of them that that would make the average player's skin crawl at just the thought of them. And at the same time, there's also a fair few number of missions that go above and beyond to create such a fun experience, and it almost feels rewarding whenever you make it to them after dealing with all the bullshit en route to them. But then, there's also that time you spend in between the missions, just fucking around with the game's mechanics, experiencing the many side activities provided within the world, or just being a general nuisance to society. So, why don't we talk about a few of them next?
Alright, here's where we get into the real fun stuff in this game. As awesome as San Andreas' story is, as iconic as its characters are, and as memorable as its missions have become, let's be real for a minute and recognize that the real fun of this game came from the game itself. In this section, we're gonna talk about the many little mechanics that made San Andreas such a fun game to fuck around on back in the day, and that still have so many people like me coming back to it all these years later. On top of that, we're also gonna talk about a bunch of side activities that you can partake in within this world that will keep you playing for hours and hours without feeling bored. And of course, we're gonna talk about some of the many, many cheat codes that have the ability to turn this gangster's paradise into a wonderland of mayhem and chaos. First, let's go over some of San Andreas' mechanics. Starting off with the basics, we have our very simple aiming system that greatly improved upon the foundation laid out in the Grand Theft Autos before this one. While in GTA's 3 and Vice City, you had this incredibly basic and somewhat wonky aiming system that definitely got the job done, San Andreas did a great job building on it by adding the abilities to see your target's health and even seamlessly free aim, allowing you to more easily pick the specific target you want to shoot at or even go for head shots. Additionally, San Andreas added the ability to climb for the first time in GTA, which may not sound like much nowadays, but considering the best that we had before this was jumping at a wall and hoping that you might be able to get over it, this was pretty revolutionary. Plus, for whatever reason, my retarded little brain loved being able to climb on the buildings in Grove Street and Idlewood when I was little, and just seeing how far I could parkour before I fell back down to the ground. So I'm giving this random feature one point for that sprinkle of nostalgia. But another feature that I still love to this day is the ability to recruit homies to roll with you as you ride through the streets of Los Santos. By simply aiming at a friendly gangster and pressing up on the d-pad, you can recruit Grove Street family members to either fight alongside you as you go along on your adventures, or to simply hang out with you as you chill out in the grove. But this right here is genuinely one of my favorite features in any Grand Theft Auto game. And honestly, I always thought it was quite a shame that Rockstar never really improved on this feature anymore in their future games, apart from Vice City Stories, which kinda did, but didn't really do a great job at it to be honest. But another genuinely groundbreaking innovation in San Andreas was not just the ability to swim, but also to swim underwater. Granted, there's not that much reason to ever have to swim in this game, especially underwater for that matter, but the fact that you don't instantly drown as soon as your feet get wet is a huge positive in my opinion. And just by having this ability, you can always find your own ways to have fun with it like me and my brother used to back in the day. Oh, and you want to know something even cooler? If we wanted to, my brother and I could have even played this game together when we were little. He never wanted to, but we definitely could have. And that's because San Andreas has a fucking two-player mode. Now, I know we're spoiled in this current day and age where all you need for a multiplayer GTA experience is an internet connection, and maybe a mortgage too if you want to be able to have fun. But the idea of a Grand Theft Auto from this time period having a multiplayer of any kind is still mind-blowing to me to this day. Words cannot describe how much fun I've had with this mode over the years. Be it with the classic vanilla mode itself in which you would walk into this pickup as CJ, wait for your second player to pick their skin, and then go fuck around and cause some chaos, or with the modded version that built upon the original that me and my buddy Christian used to play nearly the entire story mode with. Seriously, if I were to go into how fucking amazingly fun this two-player mode is, we'd be here all day, and this video is already long enough, so if you'd like to see it for yourself, then I'd highly recommend that you check out my San Andreas two-player series to see the antics Christian and I got into, as well as the many ways that we broke the game. P.S. I just want to say that I haven't forgotten about that series, and I really do plan to finish it one day. Back to the single player experience, though. Let's talk about all the customization options that Rockstar added with this entry to the GTA series. First of all, we've got several stats that we can improve throughout the game, and even some that can decline if we don't take care of them. Most stats, like driving skill, biking skill, and several weapon skills will start off at the bare minimum, and it's up to you to improve them, either passively by just casually driving or shooting or whatever, or more actively by going to schools in the shooting range, or both at once if this was the 2020s. Either way, the more you improve skills like driving and biking, the better your handling will become and the less likely you'll be to fall off your bike when you crash. As for guns, the more you practice using a particular weapon, the more accurate you'll become with it. And once you've achieved Hitman level, you may become adept in akimbo if the gun's small enough, or if it's a larger gun that requires you to be stationary while firing it, you'll unlock the ability to move while shooting. Meanwhile, other stats like fat, muscle, and stamina can all be altered at the gym. While fat can be gained by eating too much food, you can burn it back off at the gym with a bike or the treadmill, and you can also gain stamina this way too. Alternatively, you could also just ride a bike or run around to achieve the same results. Muscle, on the other hand, can only be gained by lifting weights, and if you start to starve, your muscle will be the first thing to start deteriorating. While some people might find RPG elements like this out of place in a Grand Theft Auto title, I've always loved the idea of being able to alter CJ and physically depict him however I want. And I've always thought too that it was really cool how as you play on through the game and become more skillful at certain things, so does CJ to almost mirror your own abilities. But sticking with CJ's physical appearance, you can also change his look by visiting various clothes shops, barbers, and tattoo parlors throughout the state. If you want CJ to represent the set, you can color him up in green and lead the grove by example. Or if you want to join Smoke and Rider in their treacherous ways, you can down the purple to roleplay as a bala. Maybe you want to leave the gang life and pursue your true passion as a boxer. That's cool too. Or maybe Biker CJ's the look. Or Tuxedo CJ. Or even Dom CJ. The possibilities are endless with all the customization options within San Andreas, which just adds another level of depth to this game's fun as it allows you to personalize CJ 
CJ to fit your own style, in a way that wouldn't really be recreated properly until 9 years later in GTA Online. So far in this section, I've mostly just talked about ways that you can have fun pretty much within the realm of your own creativity and imagination. But in addition to everything I've listed so far, there's also a large selection of side activities to partake in. For starters, have you ever wanted to play as a cop in GTA? Well, Vigilante Mode allows you to take on that role as you apprehend criminals just like a typical cop in 90s LA. Or if you want to try another branch of emergency services, there's also Paramedic Mode, where you have to go around town picking up injured civilians to bring them back to the hospital. And Firefighter Mode, which has you racing through the streets to extinguish burning cars and civilians. Each of these three modes have 12 rounds that get progressively more difficult as time goes on, but if you're able to beat them, you'll unlock an upgrade or special ability. For beating Vigilante, you'll receive a 50% boost to your armor. Paramedic, meanwhile, awards you with the maximum health stat, and Firefighter makes you fireproof. On the flip side of these lawful roles that you can play throughout the world, there's also a couple of illegal ventures to pursue. Let's talk about the funnier one first, pimping. This side activity is pretty simple. Pick up one girl, take her to a client. Pick up the other girl, take her to her client. Then pick the first girl back up, take her to her next client, and so on. After you do this enough, you'll eventually earn the upgrade that makes me call this the funnier venture, since your new ability is that prostitutes will now pay you to have sex with them. Yeah, it's not anywhere near as groundbreaking of a difference maker compared to the emergency service upgrades, but hey, at least this should theoretically give Hillary Clinton one less reason to hate video games so much. As for the other illegal side activity, if you're able to find one of these vans at nighttime, you can begin burglary mode. In this mode, you have to break and enter into various homes, steal their stuff, bring their stuff back to your van, and then bring the van back to the lockup. Rinse and repeat until you've stolen $10,000 worth of goods, and you'll be awarded $3,000 for your efforts. Yeah, it's not much, but it's... hmm. Uh, you know what, actually, I don't think this is Honest Work, is it? Don't worry, Honest Work is up next as San Andreas gives you the opportunity to do something I think we've all enjoyed doing at one point or another in this game, and that's drive the damn train. Through the freight missions, you're simply tasked with driving a train around the whole map while stopping at each station. While this can mostly be seen as a time killer, since all you really have to do in this mission is hold down the X button, it's definitely a fun way to just pass the time and explore this insanely vast world from a different and relaxing perspective. But don't get too comfortable, though, or, uh, yeah. But hey, at least you don't have to worry about that with taxi mode which is exactly as it sounds like. Plus or minus what's apparently the fucking Latino national anthem from GTA 5. <laughs> Alright, there's probably a million other little modes and things to do that I haven't listed. Things like dating, playing pool, playing arcade machines, doing courier missions, and so many others. But I physically cannot remember every single one, nor do I want this video to be 10 hours long. So just take my word when I say that there's so much more content here that I just cannot talk about it all. That being said, there's also a lot more content hidden from the unknowing player. Content that, in order to access it, you gotta know a guy. In my case, growing up, that guy was GameSpot.com. And that guy had access to every single game-altering cheat code that could take your San Andreas experience to an entirely new level. Whether you want to play this game on easy mode like the child I used to be and activate cheats like no cops, infinite ammo, and infinite health, or if you just wanted to fuck around by activating chaos mode, super punch, and spawn rhino tank, this world quickly became yours to do whatever the holy hell you want with it. Seriously, I cannot understate how impactful these cheat codes are at making what already has to be considered one of the greatest games ever even better. If you want the ability to fly your car across the map, you're just one immaculate button combination away from unlocking it. Or maybe you want to see what would happen if there were no red lights on the road. Right, R1 up, L2, L2 left, R1, L1, R1, R1. Thank me later. Shit, maybe you want to be able to free aim out of your car like you're in GTA 5. It may look a little wonky, but it gets the job done. And what I've listed so far is just a small taste of the large variety of cheats at your disposal. There's also plenty of other fun ones that let you spawn a fair number of rare vehicles, including a monster truck, a VTOL military jet, a tank, and even a jetpack. There's cheats that'll let you jump up a building or bunny hop into the sky. There's cheats that'll send cars flying away when you hit them. There's cheats that'll let you recruit anybody to your gang. Cheats that'll turn every car pink, cheats that'll turn cars invisible, that'll let cars drive on water, that'll control the weather, that'll control the time, control the speed of the game, give you weapons, restore your health, turn everyone into prostitutes, turn everyone into clowns, start a riot, raise your water level, raise your stats, and so, so many more. To put it into perspective for you, here's a list of all the cheats in this game that puts the list of Jericho to shame. I can't think of any other game that's ever had this many cheat codes in it. And it really makes me sad to know that the more modern GTAs 4 and 5 together only have a small fraction of the amount of cheats that San Andreas did. I fondly remember the days of my brother and I printing out sheets of cheats on the computer in the living room, or just filling folders with notebook paper with the cheat codes handwritten out button for button across each page, and then bringing it all back to our bedroom to see what carnage we could create in this world. And judging by the direction gaming's taken in the past two decades since San Andreas' release, it seems that times like those are just a thing of the past, as cheat codes have simply become a novelty of a nostalgic time. But you know what's still popping off today? Mods. And believe me when I say that San Andreas has a lot of those too. If 20 years of fucking around activating these cheat codes has gotten stale for you, then allow me to introduce you 
to the vast library of mods that you can use to drastically change your experience. Now everyone's going to have their own preferences for what they enjoy and how they want to inject new life into their game, but I personally enjoy the ones that maintain the original look and spirit of San Andreas, while improving several of its aspects with updated textures and quality of life improvements. The only updated texture of mine that I'll actually go over here is that of the weapon icons, just because of the indescribable feeling I had when I first looked at these things. I'm not exaggerating when I say that seeing these new icons for the first time, it genuinely gave me that feeling of being a kid and playing San Andreas for the first time again. I don't know exactly what it was about seeing these small icons in the corner, but I think it was seeing these new, arguably better icons that were in the same familiar style as the old ones. It just called out to the child in me and legitimately reinvigorated my love and passion for this game. Apart from that, there's also a plethora of other mods that I have installed that have added new life for one reason or another. Here's one that allows you to tag any wall that you find with your own choice of graffiti. And what's even cooler about this mod is that your tag will stay there forever, unless you choose to erase it all. There's also a mod that'll add more variety to the trailers that you'll see semis pulling. And I've got another one that changes how the AI will drive on the road to make them look less scripted. Staking with cars for another second, check out this mod that creates a chance for one of your car's wheels to detach when you get into a big crash. And what's even cooler is that the car is still drivable with its wheel missing. Oh, and remember when I was talking about how sad the end of the game makes me since it means you don't get to see the other characters anymore? Well, this Hangout mod changes things as it allows you to go driving around with several characters that you've gotten to know throughout the story. And here's another cool mod of mine that restores all the gangs from the beta. Not only does this add conquerable territories for numerous gangs around the map, like the Rifas in San Fierro or the Mafia in Las Venturas, but it also adds removed gangs, like the Bikers and the Russians in Los Santos. And like I said, these gang territories are conquerable, which means you can provoke gang wars all throughout the map and have Grove Street families start spawning as far as Tierra Robata. Plus, another really cool feature in this mod is the re-inclusion of several scrapped beta gang skins. And the best part is, is that these skins don't overwrite the already existing vanilla skins, which means you'll see a lot more variety around the hood, especially for the Ballas and GSF. Now, I'm not going to go over every mod that I have, but I've saved the best one I want to talk about for last, and that's the two-player mod. I've already briefly talked about this one a few minutes ago, but let me just explain why I love this so much. As I said before, I used to have so much fun playing the regular two-player mode with my friends and family when I was little, but with pretty much all of that mode's restrictions lifted, this essentially transformed San Andreas into a whole new game for me given the incomparable experience it offers. As those of you who've watched mine and Christian's playthrough of the story will know, the opportunities this mod gives you to have fun, be it by viewing the world from a new perspective, breaking the game and or its cutscenes, or just playing the best game in the world with a friend who has so many similar nostalgic experiences as you. This absolutely revolutionary mod has found a way to make this game just that much better and that much more fun to pick up and play. Those are some of the main mods that have had some impact in bettering my own San Andreas, but there are so many others that have the capability to do the same thing for other players out there. There's some simple ones that can add something like a gravity gun to your game, and then there's also some incredibly complex mods like Total Conversions that essentially use San Andreas to build an entirely new game, and then there's everything else in between. If you ever wanted to play as the Undertaker in San Andreas, you can. Even if you've ever wanted to just completely break the game in an unstoppable wave of chaos, the Randomizer mod lets you do just that. Hell, apparently you can even travel across the entire United States and visit both Vice City and Liberty City within the game by downloading the Stars and Stripes mod. When I say the possibilities are endless, I mean they're endless. Of course though, with so many mods in play, your game might end up crashing often enough to where you'd fear losing a significant amount of progress if you didn't save the game after every mission or two. But luckily, there's also this Save Anywhere mod that exists to let you, as the name suggests, save anywhere, which has certainly helped me out many times over the past few years. Needless to say, there are plenty of fun features within the world of San Andreas, and while everything that's in the game itself has done a great job for 20 years of providing me with ways to entertain myself, there's always more ways to turn this already amazing game into something even better, whether it's by finding and activating various cheat codes, or by going out and adding in mods to spice things up. But there's still one thing left to talk about that rounds the whole game out to create an unforgettable experience that has people like me coming back every now and then. And of course, that's San Andreas' music. Alright, I'm gonna go out here and make a very bold claim, and that's that San Andreas has the best soundtrack out of any Grand Theft Auto to have ever been made. I know there's gonna be a lot of disagreement here, especially from those of you who love Vice City, but just let me give my reasoning behind it. See, whenever I'm just listening to some music and minding my business, occasionally I'll hear a song like Plush by Stone Temple Pilots or Ice Cube's Today Was A Good Day, and in that moment of recognizing the song, I'll be taken right back to the times when I used to spend hours roaming around Los Santos doing drive-bys on those dirty ball of dope pushers, or if I ever randomly here, Cross the Tracks by Macchio and the Max, god I hope I pronounced his name right, I can't help but think back to when I was a kid playing blackjack and video poker in the casino. That's right, the main reason why I consider this soundtrack to be the best of all time is simply for nostalgia, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Growing up, the music in this game was the music that I listened to all the time, and is what helped form my taste in music. Like seriously, I'm certain that I have San Andreas, Smackdown vs Raw 2007, and Guitar Hero to thank for my love of rock music. So of course I'm gonna have the opinion that one of the games that started it all for me is the one that has the best music of its series. But nostalgia aside, 
aside, can you really blame me for loving San Andreas' soundtrack so much? I've already named a couple of its greater songs, but let's go ahead and list some more. On KDST, there's absolute rock classics like Slow Ride, Hold the Line, Freebird, A Horse with No Name, Two Tickets to Paradise, and White Wedding. On K-Rose, there's no shortage of country greatness with songs like Amos Moses, Louisiana Woman, Mississippi Man, I Love a Rainy Night, and The Letter That Johnny Walker Read. Seriously, there's a reason why whenever anybody asks me if I listen to country, my response is always that I listen to San Andreas country, and it's because these are some of the only songs I've ever really enjoyed from that genre. Moving on to the rap scene that I've never been a huge fan of, as those who have watched my Liberty City Stories video will already know, even I can't deny the bangers Radio Los Santos has at its disposal. In what's gotta be one of the greatest rap compilations of all time, there's no shortage of talent here as we have artists and groups like Tupac with I Don't Give a Fuck, NWA's version of Express Yourself, Easy Ease, Easier to Said Than Done, Ice Cube's The Message Remix, Check Yourself, and Hood Took Me Under by Compton's Most Wanted. Rockstar definitely did not fuck around with their chance to include the iconic West Coast rap scene of the 90s in their game, but in my opinion, they did even better with my personal favorite station, Radio X. As much as I'd love to list every song on this station because of how good they all are, I'll hold myself back and just name a few of the absolute best, like Cult of Personality, Welcome to the Jungle, Hellraiser, Rusty Cage, and- these are just a handful of the songs that helped San Andreas play a huge part in defining my childhood, and by extension, helped establish my taste in music to turn me into the Three Days Grace and Breaking Benjamin loving teenager I used to be, as well as the bad omens and motionless and white loving adult that I am now. In addition to all of these amazing radio stations though, there were a few others on the side that could be playing almost any song in the car that I just stole that would make me refrain from switching over to Radio X for just a little bit. Playback FM had some good songs like Slick Rick's Children's Story and It Takes Two by Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock. Bounce FM had You Dropped a Bomb on Me and and Hollywood Swingin', shout out to WrestleMania 39. CSR 103.9 had Motown Philly and Poison. Keja West had Pressure Drop and Drum Pan Sound. And Master Sounds 98.3 had the original Express Yourself, Funky President, and Tainted Love. Then, of course, there's WCTR that's got its brand of satirical talk shows that are legally required to be in any Grand Theft Auto game. And it's definitely a joy to listen to whenever you want to hear something besides the music on the radio. The only station in this game that I can't really vibe with whenever I hear it is SFUR, a house music station, which is just music that I've never really been that big of a fan of. But minus that, one, it's clear that San Andreas' many other radio stations are packed to the brim with phenomenal music. However, the only downside of having this many songs apparently seems to be the licensing for them, as players of the 2014 remaster and the definitive edition are sure to know. For those unaware, due to the licenses for several songs from the original game being expired and Rockstar not wanting to renew them, those songs were removed from the trilogy's definitive edition counterparts' soundtracks. Vice City and San Andreas were hit the hardest by this, with 21 of San Andreas' 155 songs being removed, which equates to about one of every seven songs being cut. This includes I Don't Give a Fuck, both versions of Express Yourself, Hellraiser, and Killing the Name, which is such a goddamn shame because San Andreas genuinely feels so empty with its iconic soundtrack being incomplete. Especially when you go on a bad day and instead of hearing Rage Against the Machine, you hear this pleasant sounding music instead to convince you that everything is fine when it's not really fine. You're fine when you're not really fine. <laughs> But we're not here to bitch and complain about the Definitive Edition, because, let's face it, that's already been done to death by everybody else, and even myself. So let's go back to talking about why San Andreas is so good by wrapping it all back up. Anybody who knows me personally very likely knows the very special place in my heart that Grand Theft Auto San Andreas has held for the past 20 years of my life, and I hope you all can now understand why that is. I've been playing this game for as long as I can remember. Seriously, some of my earliest memories on this earth are of either me or my brother playing this legendary video game. But even if I remove the nostalgia factor from my opinion, I would still consider this to be one of the best games ever made. With its feel-good story, memorable characters, fun missions, immense amount of things to do, unbelievable amount of cheat codes, limitless amount of mods, iconic sound soundtrack, and infinite ways to fuck around, and in some cases find out, it's simply impossible to play this game and not consider it so. And when you add nostalgia back into the mix, it's not even a contest. So for all those reasons, as well as the ones that I tried to rhyme, I firmly believe that GTA San Andreas is the greatest video game of all time. But of course, that's just my opinion. And I completely respect the fact that a lot of people, including some or possibly most of you, will disagree with me on this. Just like how I talked about everybody's taste in music being different back in my Vice City Stories video, I understand that there are people who have different tastes in video games in general. People who prefer rhythm games might consider one of the Guitar Hero games to be the best ever made, and there's probably some shooter fans who feel that way about Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 or Black Ops. Or if we tune it back to just the GTA realm, I know there's people who feel that Vice City is the greatest game of all time, or even GTA 4, and if I was looking at things more objectively, then even I'd probably have to argue that GTA 5 is the best game in history. The fact of the matter is that everybody is different, and so are their opinions. So if my opinion that San Andreas is the best offends you at all, then I am very sorry and I apologize for the inconvenience of me NOT GIVING A FUCK! 
unless you think GTA 3 is the best game of all time, in which case I've got the number for a local mental health clinic that I suggest you check yourself into. Oh, and one last thing that I almost completely forgot. How can you play this game in 2024? <laughs> oh yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, and I bet it's got a way better answer. Okay, but in all seriousness, the original San Andreas has actually become pretty difficult to acquire thanks to corporate greed. So if you don't already have your hands on a copy, or in my case, at least like five actually legal copies across multiple platforms, and that's not even including remasters, then you might have a hell of a time trying to find one. Luckily though, it's not impossible, so here are my personal recommendations. If you want to play this game on your PC, you can go out scouring the interwebs of probably eBay for a physical copy, or you can go on G2A.com to buy yourself a Steam key. Just be warned that going the G2A route isn't 100% reliable, and that the prices on there for San Andreas are heavily inflated since you really can't get the game anywhere else. Or if you want to play on some OG hardware, you can always find yourself a copy for either the PS2 or the original Xbox. Or maybe you want to play the original game on a more modern console. Well, that's still kind of possible as far as I'm aware. I'm not too familiar with PlayStation nowadays, but I think you could still play the original PS2 version of San Andreas on a modern PS4 and maybe even a PS5. Or if you have a physical copy for the original Xbox, then you should still be able to run it on an Xbox 360. But curiously, according to Wikipedia, while you can put the disc in an Xbox One or a Series X, you can't actually run the original version on one of those consoles as it'll install the 2014 remaster instead. Gotta love Xbox. Lastly, let's talk emulation. If you could find yourself an original PS2 or Xbox copy of the game, or if you're a sailor of the seven seas, then you can do what I did to get most of the footage for this video and run the game through PCSX2 for the PS2 version, or Zemu for the Xbox version. Whichever of the methods that I've gone over here works the best for you, or if there's any other ways to play that I haven't listed, because let's be real, San Andreas was a very accessible game at one point. I just hope that anybody who's made it this far into the video and hasn't yet played this masterpiece takes my advice of going through it, because I promise you, you will not regret it one bit. Man, I'm, uh, I'm not gonna lie. I was pretty reluctant to do this video. Whenever I'm making a video like this where I sort of review an old game, I always feel like I have to be very critical of everything as I'm playing through it to give my most honest take on it, as I did with Liberty City Stories and Vice City Stories a few months ago. And I was a bit worried that by overanalyzing everything about San Andreas and finding the flaws in a game I've always believed to be perfect, that it might somehow end up ruining this game for me altogether. But when I made my Freedom Fighters video recently, I realized that it's possible to do that kind of review and still thoroughly enjoy the game. And honestly, coming out of the other side of this process for San Andreas, I think I've got to say that I really do appreciate this game even more now, which I didn't think was even possible. So to all of you who've been watching my videos since that Liberty City Stories one, thank you for putting me on the path of making this video, because now I have so much more love for my favorite game of all time. And also, I want to take a quick second to thank you for watching up until the end. I put a lot of work into this, so it means a lot to me if you've been able to stick around to this point, but it would mean even more if you dropped a quick like on this video too. Doing so will really help me out as it'll allow this video to reach more people which could then push my other videos out to them, as well as give my entire channel a boost. And if you're wondering what's in it for you, it's simple. If you enjoy my content, but don't like how long it takes for me to produce it, then by helping me get more eyes on my videos, you'll also be helping me go full-time on this whole thing even sooner, which in turn will allow me to make these videos faster, as I'll have a lot more time on my hands to do so. And of course, if you want to see those videos when they come out, then feel free to subscribe as well. As for my next video, I'm not 100% sure what it's going to be about yet, but I'm down to about two options, and one of them is not related to Grand Theft Auto at all. Rather, the idea that I have regards the WWE 2K series, so if that's something that you think you'd want to see, then please leave a comment down below telling me so. After seeing how poorly my Freedom Fighters video performed, I'll be honest and say that I'm a bit worried about making a non-GTA video again, but I'm just gonna hope for now that the main reason that that one flopped is because nobody's ever fucking heard of Freedom Fighters. Either way though, thank you all again so much for watching, and whatever my next video ends up being on, I hope to see you all there for it. So until next time, this is your boy Doug the Dog 6 and I'm signing off.